Everybody and their grandmother knows what a director does. It's very easy to describe what they do, and they do, they do more than yell action. You know exactly what they do in terms of formatting the vision and formatting the vision and framing the story and casting and all the different elements. And you know what an actor does. You, 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 a six-year-old knows what an actor does. And it's really easy to figure out who the writer is in the film. Maybe they'll argue over who took credit, and certainly the cinematographer, even the caterer. But a producer, what does a producer do? You know, does he just take the credit and say thank you very much? Does he put the money up? Does he find the property? Does he keep the vision? Does he develop the marketing plan? Does he keep all the animals in the zoo from behaving correctly? Well, he or she does many things, and there are many different types of producers. And it's not to deride one that just finds the property and believes in the vision, as opposed to somebody who's on the set every single day in Rwanda, you know, while the film is being shot. So there are many different roles that producers play. It's a much more of a renaissance person. Um, some say they just take the credit. Some say they just take the money. Maybe they take a little of both, or a lot of both, but at any rate, this is not a business that's a philanthropy. Nobody, no studio or financier gives out the credit producer and the money to producer and the back ends to producer unless they have some leverage on them. And so they must come to the party with something. And that something is their unique skill that they bring to the process. But a really incredible thing to think about is if sometimes the producer is the vision keeper. Sometimes the producer is the one that has the unconditional commitment to get the project made. It brings in the other people creates an environment for its success, works with the studio and distributor and exhibitors, works with the marketing plan, works reminding all the people so that the vision doesn't blur between the Eureka and the audience. Can that kind of producer, that kind of filmmaking producer, is what I eschew, what I espouse, what I believe in. But that doesn't in any way denigrate from another role that another producer has. It's just the one that I see is the most valuable to me, the most inherently exciting to me. Conflict isn't bad. Happy set doesn't mean happy picture. I mean, we've had wonderful happy sets. Oh, we made a picture in New York right at Christmas time with Dudley Moore, who just came off Arthur and Ten, and Mary Tyler Moore, who just came, won the Academy Award for Ordinary People. And it was called Six Weeks, and it was just bliss making, kissing, loving, we're going to meet forever. The picture played for six minutes. It was a catastrophe. Flashdance, on the other hand, the studio was selling it. We had a guy with shaved legs doing the ending, playing the girl, four doubles, had a reshoot. Trouble on the set every minute, total smash hit. We're wired to tell story. We're wired in a narrative. Right now, as we're sitting here, there's a little voice going on behind me and behind you, yammering, yammering. Ah, this guy's full of bull. Ah, that guy's going to ask another silly question. Ah, that guy knows what he's talking about. Ah, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So we're always in a narrative form. So it's altogether fitting and proper that in this last century, we would go from a cellular memory, that's this passing of the torch, you know, verbally, so to speak to a digital memory, you know? And we've gone from a flickering images on the cave wall to giant flickering images on enormous IMAX size screens. But the, at the center of it all is still storytelling. It's still that in, in element inside that connects the eureka or the epiphany of the artist to his or her audience, thousands and thousands of miles away and maybe many, many years apart from its creation. And it's that which drives us, and it connects us. I've always spoken of the fact that there is a uh, natural integration of technology and artistry, and that it's never more evident in this new digital world where we, to succeed, have to have a merger of the poet and the engineer. When you combine those two um, uh, theories or, or conceits with the obvious situation that the rate of change has changed. Not just change, but the rate has changed. It's accelerating the change. So it's no longer a one where you can get your arms around the change. You can't say, I see change. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. That light at the end of the tunnel is a super express train called the future hurtling towards you. And if you wait to reveal it, let it reveal itself to you, your future will be depleted, your joy gone, and probably all your assets um, suborned. So you really have to run towards the monster. You have to be unconditional in your belief about the future, and you can't view it through the rearview mirror. So it takes some daring do. It takes a different type of attitude, not just merely an aptitude. The journey from the idea, that epiphany, that flash, to the audience is a long one. You have to be more than tenacious. You have to confront constant no's. It's a constant battle against the no's, the naysayer, the negativism, and the nabobs. And so what you have to do is be dyslexic.
You have to turn the no's into on's. You have to be unconditionally committed to your future, to your vision. That doesn't mean stubborn and not listening to other ideas or thoughts, but you have to believe unconditionally in the journey and its outcome. If you can do that for your career or your project, this is a business that you can succeed in.